Up next, a very unique episode of Professor of Rock, where a legendary singer-songwriter gets very vulnerable about songs that he wrote. Uh, the first is a beloved song of everyone's childhood that he wrote to say goodbye to his youth, and the second he wrote as a way to discuss divorce with his children. It's a very emotional episode that you're not gonna wanna miss, coming up. Hey Music Junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure to subscribe below right off the bat and to be a part of a community that is dedicated to the timeless music of the rock and roll era straight from the legends, the stories. And make sure to click on the bell so you don't miss out. Also, look at our Patreon link below to become a part of curating this important work and you get a lot more benefits. I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations, where featured artists go very deep into their greatest songs and albums. We're coming up on 600 total interviews that I've done since starting this years ago. The most common question that I get from people about what I do is uh, mostly, who is my favorite interview of all time and what was the greatest moment from an interview? Of course, my answers change almost daily. But I will say that there have been times where I was just completely blown away. One of my favorite artists that I've gotten to know over the years is Kenny Loggins, uh, become a friend and known as the, the king of the movie soundtrack. But Kenny Loggins is much more than that. He's had an impact on every single generation. I mean, think about it. You know, he connected with baby boomers first as part of Loggins and Messina. And it's all because your mama don't dance and your daddy don't rock and one of the most successful duos ever. He did the same with Gen Xers when he dominated movie soundtracks, you know, Top Gun, Footloose, Caddyshack, to name a few. And then Millennials and Gen Z have discovered him as the, the co-captain of Yacht Rock, along with his connections to Archer and Grand Theft Auto and you know, collaborating with the artist Thundercat, so many more. Kitty, kitty up next, Kenny Loggins opens up about writing two songs. First one is a song that started it all, House at Pooh Corner, which Kenny gave to the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Uh, Kenny Loggins wrote it and we recorded it in 1969. In fact, in the video, we also get insight from John McEwen, a founding member of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Back to the house of Pukon, about one. They relate the story of how Disney wouldn't allow the song to be recorded since they own the rights uh, to Winnie the Pooh, and how through a, a miracle, they were able to get it done. It's an amazing story. He also tells about reinventing the song in the 90s for his famous children's album. Chase all the clouds from the sky. Chase the clouds. That's the first part. Now, the second part is one of my favorites. This is where Kenny gets very vulnerable about creating a song that came as a way to explain to his young children why he and their mother were getting divorced. Uh, this was a very meaningful discussion and one of my favorite moments from an interview. You need to see it, really. Uh, very healing. All of this is next on Professor of Rock. Now, as we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenni Eyewear, my favorite glasses ever. At zenni.com, you can design your own glasses, and then you can do a virtual try-in where you can see exactly how the eyewear is going to look on you. And you can make sure that it matches your face with you know, Zenni's virtual mirror feature. Check it out now at zenni.com. Here's Kenny with the interview. And I've got to get back to the house at the corner by one. Couldn't go without asking you about House of Pooh Corner. Tell me real quick about the story about how you wrote it and then okay. the verse you added to it. This song, uh, another one that I wrote as a senior in high school. I was going on graduation and I suddenly saw the parallel of Christopher Robin leaving the 100 Acre Wood and that was where I was in my life. Uh, I guess a uh, cut to a uh, year and some later, I've graduated, I've got a place of my own. I got a, my first job as a songwriter, and uh, I made a hundred bucks a week as a songwriter, and um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and for that they got House of Pooh Corner. Right? I think they got they made their money back. And the way I got my songs heard was I would go to different parties, and there'd be a lot of songwriters that would show up, 
And uh, at this one particular party, there were a couple guys from the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band who were there. He said his name Bojangles and he danced a lick. I was living in, in Laurel Canyon, which was in the, you know, the late 60s, $90 a month for including utilities. <laughs> <laughs> Across the street was Scott McKenzie with flowers in his hair, and <laughs> down the street, mamas and papas. Across from them, mothers of invention, and it was a big conglomeration of people trying to figure out how to get on the radio. Then there was this kid hanging around the Troubadour dressing room, 19 years old, going, "Hey, I got some songs. If you guys want to do some, so I got some songs. Maybe you, maybe you like this one, or maybe, or maybe you like this one." Whatever it was, a yeah, very right. excitable boy <laughs> he was. And they uh, they loved the song about the bear and they wanted to do it. So Kenny came up and I recorded a demo with uh, six songs on it of just him and his guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, House of Pooh Corner was one of them. We wanted to put out House of Pooh Corner because it seemed perfect for the market at the time. A blend of acoustic... Uh, drums, electric guitar, doing little cute licks. I've got to give back to the house of what happened there was, we got the call from Disney, the record company did. Can't put it out, we own the Pooh Corner. A few months later, I got a phone call from John McEwen, and he says, we can't do that song. I said, what's, what's going on? He said, well, we've been inundated with phone calls from the Disney attorneys. And they claim they have a thing called a copyright on that sucker. And <laughs> so we are ceasing and desisting. And I, I was really bummed. And this is a true story. And I told my, my girlfriend, I'm, I, we were going on a date that night. And I said, I'm, I'm kind of bummed. I, I thought I had my first song recorded and it's not going to happen. The Disney lawyers killed it in the water. And she looked at me and she goes, Disney lawyers? Let me talk to daddy about that. I did not know that I was dating the daughter of the CEO of the Disney Corporation. <laughs> and proving there is a God. She took me home to meet her dad, sat on the floor, and I played House of Pooh Corner. Now, I'm, I'm 20, maybe, yeah. I'm sure he was looking at me going, no way in hell is anybody ever going to hear this song. So he called the lawyers and said, okay, let him have it. And it made it to, I think it made it, if that's Made it what, top, that's Kansas City it was number one, and New York it was probably number 47. You know, in different parts of the country, it was a top 20 hit. Winnie the Pooh doesn't know what to do. God. And so that's why, if you've ever thought about that, why did Kenny Loggins get to sing the only other song about Winnie the Pooh? Yeah. That, that should not have happened. That I consider an act of God. That just was <laughs> like, we're going to make this happen now. And years sure. later, uh, the Sherman brothers wrote, Winnie the Pooh, Winnie right. the Pooh, fuzzy little cubby. We all stuffed with fluffies, Winnie the Pooh. A, a girl working in the Disney offices named Bambi, <laughs> swear to God, called me and the Sherman brothers and brought us in to write the theme song to the Tigger movie. So that circle completed. Yeah. And your heart will make you home. Return to Pooh Corner. Tell me about putting that together. That came from uh, that time of my life. My daughter, Bella, was a baby, and my job was to put her to bed at night. Mm -hmm. So I would go up to her room, and we'd sit in the rocking chair, and I would sing whatever came to my mind and sing her to sleep. I got the idea of writing a new third verse to, to House of Pooh Corner because I wrote that when I was a senior in high school. Mm -hmm. So that was the child leaving his childhood behind. Now, at that stage, I was, what, 20 years later, and I was ready to write the point of view of a father. After all said and done, I was watching my son. So it was more like watching the wheel go around some more. Right. So I wrote a new third verse to it, and Crosby, my oldest, named it Return to Pooh Corner. Swear, battle bear, whispered boy, Welcome. Kenny said that he will always be grateful for that chance you gave him because that opened up his career in a lot well, of the ways. The chance we gave him, well, the, the, the chance he gave us is what I, the way I look at it. <laughs> That's so nice. I mean, he was a magical, still is, former songwriter, guy full of energy.
You'd be surprised there's so much to be done. And you go again. Can I all that be in the light? Chase all the clouds from the sky back to the days of Christopher Robin Poo. And you lie there in the dark and wonder why. Tell me about the time of writing Leap of Faith, because it's a pretty deep album, man. Yeah, it is. That is one of those rare moments in an artist's life where your life and your music coincide. Mm -hmm. My marriage was falling apart when I started the record. And then through the process of writing and making the record, we initiated the divorce. And with, within a few months of being out of the house, I fell in love with the woman who would become my next wife. And so that whole metamorphosis of moving out of the known and into the unknown, and then into this whole sort of hard open space of being in love and what happens next. I'll always hold you in my soul. My favorite song that you've ever done, such a personal song, and I was sitting in an office of a Hollywood executive a couple of years ago, and we are talking about music saves lives and different things. I didn't even mention anything, and he just told me this story that he was going through a divorce and he had to sit his three kids down and try to explain to them why he and their mother were, were splitting up. And he played him that song. He said, I'll always be grateful to Kenny Loggins because that was the song that meant so much to me and how I was able to explain to my children what we were going through. And that's what music does. Tell me the story about and that. That's, Play a little th bit, that's the mind. only pro-divorce song out there as far <laughs> yeah. as I know. Uh, boy. Um, so when my first marriage was breaking up, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but I had a freedom song for me. It was uh, Lyle Lovett, If I Had a Boat. Do you know that one? Yeah. Uh, if I, oh, well, I don't know. If I, if I had to go out on the ocean And if I had a pony I'd ride him on my boat And we get all together And go out on the ocean Send me up on my pony on my boat Great line in that song. History's masked man was smart. He got himself a Tonto. Cause Tonto did the dirty work for free. But Tano, he was smarter. And one day said, Kimo Sabe, kiss my ass, I bought a boat, I'm going out to sea. And if I had a boat, I'd go out on the ocean. And if I had a pony, I'd ride him on my boat. And we get all together and go out on the ocean. Send me up on my pony on my boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, everybody's got a boat up on the ocean. But not every butt. Is there someone there for me? I'm ready to be. And the boys, because love should teach you joy, and not the imitation that your mama and daddy trying to show you. I did it for you, for me, because I still believe there's only one thing you can never give up, ever compromise on, and that's the real thing you need in. I don't know, it modulates or something. <laughs> oh, love. Yeah. Tell yeah. us the story about writing that uh, song. It's one of my favorite stories. I know it's emotional. Yeah, no, I was writing a song for my daughter's christening, still married, and I'd promised that I would write a song for this ceremony. And I figured since no one would ever hear the song, I was just going to turn on my tape recorder. We had those back then. And... <laughs> and sing whatever came to my mind and just trust that that would be the right song for the ceremony and started just pacing the room and singing just off the top of my head 
And out came that melody, I did it for you and the boys because love should teach you joy and not the imitation that your mommy and daddy tried to show you. And I stopped and it knocked my wind out. I did not see that coming. That was not the appropriate song for that ceremony. And it scared the shit out of me and I put it in a drawer and hid from it for a year. And until the appropriate ceremony showed up, which they called divorce, and uh, and then I went to Canada and I finished it with uh, David Foster. David Foster. And I remember we were writing the verse and doing the chorus and, and he turned to me and he said, dude, is this happening to you? And I went, no. That's how honest we are with each other when we're, you know, I wasn't ready to go there, but it was happening. And that's the real thing you need. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment on your thoughts about this song, well, these songs, and this interview. Tell us uh, maybe about how a particular song helped you through a trial. What are your top logins tracks? Let us know in the comments section below. If you like our content, we invite you to click on the subscriber button to get more content and support our mission. Uh, become a patron at the link below. Help us keep the music alive. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.